Good evening and once again welcome. This lesson is being recorded for Sunday, April the 30th, 2023. This is the second lesson of the day, the lesson that will be presented when we gather together at 6 o'clock here in Bellflower, California. And as I always say, if you are in our area, please come and be with us as we gather together to worship God. It is my desire that as these messages are shared, that uh, that you do not use this as a replacement for assembling together with the saints. God wants you to gather together with saints in a local in a local congregation. And so please do not use this and think of it as that, but rather this is presented as an opportunity to present the Word of God and to inform you about what we are teaching when we come together. Uh, it is my hope that it is according to the Word of God. And with that in mind, let's go ahead and get to the lesson at hand for the evening. This particular lesson is a little bit different from one of the things that we typically do. As you know, that we've started uh, on the fourth Sunday of the month having a having a, a, a singing for the Sunday evening service. And, and the reason we say the fourth Sunday and not the last Sunday of the month is because for now well over a decade, I have devoted the fifth Sunday evening service to examining a song that we sing from time to time. And with my study the last time that I did a lesson, I made an announcement to the congregation here that what I was going to do for this particular lesson is a little bit different. And that is I was going to talk about some of the obscure phrases that we find in songs so that we could have a little better understanding of um, some of the songs that we sing and, and a, re a reminder of what some of the expressions mean. And this is something that is important for us to understand because Scripture teaches that singing is an act of worship. And not only is it an act of worship, it is an act of teaching. It involves teaching. And when we sing, we are to do so with the understanding. In 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 15, where Paul is dealing with the saints assembling together, he says there, what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the understanding. In Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse number 19, Paul there in that text Father in that text talks about how we how we are, are, are singing to one another and making melody in your hearts. Uh, where he makes the point there that you speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. And in Colossians chapter 3 and in verse 16, even more specific, he says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You put all these verses together, it becomes clear that singing is an act of worship, but not only is it an act of worship, it is, it's a, about much more than simply how good it sounds or how musically talented we are. Now, while I believe we ought to give God our best and do the best in everything that we do, we need to understand that our singing is about praising God first and foremost. And secondly, it's about edifying one another, building each other up. God in his wisdom gave us the acts of worship in such a way that not only is he glorified and magnified, but we are edified. We are spiritually built up when we worship God the way that he instructs for us to do. So it's important that when we sing songs together as a congregation, we need to understand that they have to be true to God's word. Because we're teaching. And if we're teaching and admonishing one another, number one, it needs to be true. But number two, we need to understand what that message is about. So tonight, what I want to do is I want to address the wording of some songs that we occasionally sing. Songs that we sing from time to time. And there's observations to be made as to why we need to think about this from time to time. And one of the reasons is there are some of these words that we find in our songbook that are 
that are more obscure or they are archaic. That is, they're, they're taken from a time when they were used uh, decades or, in some cases, centuries ago. And wordings have changed a little bit. There are some phrases where we need a scriptural context to gain a better understanding of what the phrase or the word is. And there are some that need explanation as to whether or not we should even sing them. You know, uh, you, you look at certain expressions and it might call to your mind, is it scriptural to sing this phrase? And we ought to give consideration to, do, to that. You know, I, I don't think if, if you're asking that question, you ought to outright dismiss it and say, no, we can't sing that song. I think we need to do an examination first and see whether or not we can sing that song, whether or not we can reconcile what that song is saying with the truth of God's Word. So it does good to engage in exercises like this from time to time to, to, to consider the songs that we sing. And that's why I've been doing this for, for, uh, for more than a decade on the fifth Sunday, you know, going through the songs we sing, giving us a better understanding of what's in them. But today, let's just look at some of the words of some of these songs. Now, I, I do want to give a qualifier here as, as I introduce this particular lesson here. And that is I want you to understand that this is a challenging thing to do. And the reason it's challenging, uh, as I present this lesson, you know, I'm going to present uh, my understanding of these words as they relate to what the Word of God actually has to say. But we need to understand that as we're dealing with the wordings of songs, sometimes the meaning is subjective. And, and one of the things you have to consider in this is sometimes no matter what is said about a certain song, uh, somebody is likely to disagree with, uh, with that. You know, some might disagree with my conclusions about a particular songs that we might make mention to in this particular lesson, and and and, and if you do, and you know, I'm I'd be willing to sit down and talk about that. I think that's something that we ought to be able to engage in discussion. Of course, I ask that if we do engage in a discussion, that we're willing to have an open mind, uh, that we have the type of love that God wants us to have as Christians, and that we respect each other. And that we're willing to consider, you know what, that's not the way I see that phrase, but I see where you're coming from, and uh, where you're coming from is a plausible explanation for that song. I think that's something that we need to think about, at least one of the considerations we need to give as we think about these songs. Now, having said that, realize that our first priority as we select songs, is to ask the question, is it true to God's word? Understand and hear me clearly. If, if a song has an unscriptural message, then if we sing that song, we're, we're teaching error. That's why we need to make sure that what is being sung is true to God's word and that it is understood by the audience. And that might require clarification. You know, I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians 14 once again. And understand that Paul's dealing with worship. And I realize that he's dealing with spiritual gifts, the speaking in tongues, um, prophesying, the things that we're not doing today. But yet there's principles in it we give consideration to. And he makes the point here in verse 6 of, Rome, of 1 Corinthians 14. Brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues... What shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So likewise you, unless um, you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. And he's making the point there, you know, that when you look at instruments, they make clear and certain sounds. You know what type of an instrument it is by the sound that it makes. And, you know, in the case of a trumpet, a trumpet would announce different things, and you needed to know what the different 
uh, melodies of the trumpet were so that you would know how to respond based upon what was being said. And you know, the same thing is true when it comes to singing. The words need to be clear. And we need to ensure that people understand what is being said in a song, especially uh, if there's an obscure word in the song or, or, or maybe a phrase that some question. Clarify before you sing the song. And understand that that's something that a song leader can do. I'd like to see it more often where, where a song leader, before he begins the song, maybe takes a moment to clarify something about that song if it needs to be done. That's a good thing. And secondly, and this is something else that you have to think about when it comes to singing, and that is the fact that we need to realize that songs are a form of poetry. And because songs are a form of poetry, that means that they use poetic devices, such as, you know, sometimes their words are chosen because they rhyme. Sometimes it's about cadence or, 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 or how the song flows. And those are factored into the words that are chosen. How many words or how many, uh, you know, how many syllables there are in a specific phrase because that's necessary for poetry, and often putting a song with multiple verses to music, that has to be given consideration to. And that's why word order sometimes changes. You know, uh, a song may be based upon a, a passage of scripture, but, but the words are in a different order because it's a song. But yet the message is true to God's word. And sometimes... There are words that are more obscure or multi-defined. And what I mean by that is a word may have more than one definition. And this is when it becomes a challenge. Because there are some songs where a certain phrase or a certain word, when understood one way, is scriptural. But if it's understood in a different way, it is not scriptural. And that's when, and that's when clarif clarification needs to take place. And again, I report that, that or, or I, and again, I mentioned that song leaders sometimes can do some clarifying as they prepare to lead songs. But what I want to do first and foremost as I go through this song, and, and we'll see how far we get. This may turn into a two-part lesson depending on how long this takes. But the first thing that I want to do is I want us to look at some of the phrases and some of the words in, in songs that we sing to make clarification. And, 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 and as I do that, I, 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 want, I want us to remember that many of the songs that we sing are decades or even centuries old. When you give consideration to that, realize that the usage of certain words as well as the meanings of those words may have changed over time. And, and if we take the time to do some research and clarify what was intended as the song was being written, what the word meant back then, that can be helpful. But also with, uh, with clarification, the intended message can be made known. Now, we have started using R.J. Stephen Publishers uh, Hymns for Worship uh, and the song numbers that I'm going to present as I go through this lesson are based upon that particular songbook. And, and I made the decision as I put these together, I have got them in the order in which the songs are presented. In other words, if you have a copy of a songbook, Hymns for Worship, uh, and that is this particular songbook right here, if you have a copy of that, um, and you want to follow along, we're going to start at the beginning and uh, we're going to move through a, a handful of songs in numerical order. So let's go ahead and get started. And the first one that we want to talk about is song number 109. Song number 109, which is, uh, which is uh, Higher Ground. And this is a song that's about basically as we live this life, we're pressing toward heaven when this life is on. And I'm pressing on the upward way. I'm trying to make my way to heaven is the point 
of what we're reading in this. And every day I try to get closer and closer. And in the chorus of this song, you read, Your Lord, lift me up, let me stand, by faith on heaven's table land. What does that expression, table land, actually mean? That's, uh, I see that as one of these archaic terms that we don't find a whole lot anymore. But looking up the definition, it's reference to what you might describe as a plateau. And in case you wonder what a plateau is, a plateau is a broad, level place. And usually you're dealing with a, a mountainous region, or, or maybe you're dealing with a canyon, and, and the, uh, the top of the canyon is flat, and, and so you have a plateau that you can overlook into the canyon. Or maybe you're on the top of a mountain and you're looking down. Or you're looking up at a plateau, if you will. So that's the idea of a table land. Now the idea of uh, uh, let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, I see the idea that is a reference to the fact that as we live our lives, we're focusing and we're looking toward heaven. And whatever we learn about what heaven is like, we're thinking about that. And it's as if we're standing on a, it's on, on a plateau and we're looking at heaven in the future or, or in, in, in the distance. And that's where we want to be. And it's our desire to live anticipating this beautiful and wonderful place when this life is over. And as an example, I actually think of Moses. Uh, remember how Moses was not going to be permitted to enter into the promised land uh, because he, because he uh, struck the rock instead of speaking to it? And uh, the error at Kadesh? And you find that before Moses dies, the Lord allows him to see the land of Canaan and he takes him up on the top of a mountain and he lets him see the land. He won't let him enter because of the promise. And I want you to understand, Moses was not lost. We know that for a fact. But, but we have here, he, he allows him to see that, the promised land. And that's the kind of an idea that I see as we're singing this song. We're anticipating heaven and we studied about heaven and what we know about heaven gives us hope. That's what we see as we see in that particular song there. The next expression going to number 152, we find here a Lord's Supper song, and we have actually uh, several Lord's Supper songs on this particular list. And you find here that this particular song, it's by Christ redeemed, number 152. And it's about how we keep the supper of the word, and we continue to do so until he come until he returns. But now in the third verse, the second verse talks about his body, body given for us and his blood shed. And then we read, and thus that dark betrayal night when we the last advent we unite by one bright chain of loving right until he comes. That word advent that is used there, what exactly does that mean? You know, much of the religious world, as they use the term advent, they associate it with the birth of Jesus. And thus they have the advent season, the advent calendars. And of course, we know that biblically that type of an observance is not actually mentioned. But the word advent, as I understand, would be an ar archaic word. And it's a word that actually means the coming arrival or appearance of something. And I think this song is that, thus that dark betrayal night with the last advent we unite. He's talking about the time arrived for Jesus to die. And as we partake of the Lord's Supper, we remember that day, that advent, what occurred on that occasion. And, and, and uh, 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 it, was, it was on that occasion that the Lord's Supper was actually instituted. And that's some of the point that is emphasized in this song. And we continue to remember that. We remember that night. We remember him instituting the Lord's Supper. We remember him in the garden. We remember him being crucified the next day until he come. We do that as we partake of the Lord's Supper each week. Well, another song we might look at, just turn over another page, is a wonderful love of Jesus. And at the beginning of that, it uses this expression, in vain and high and holy lays, 
my soul her grateful voice would praise. What does that word lays mean as it is used here? Of course, we know lays is different today. When we think of lays, we think of a potato, potato chip or something. But here the idea of lays is it's an archaic word that indicates the idea of a song. And that's what it is talking about here. And he's talking about it in vain and high and holy lays. And of course, uh, the point he's making, you know, our singing is not to be vain. But the emphasis is that our singing, no matter what we sing and with the understanding, it, it's empty compared to the real thing, if you will. Uh, or as great as God actually is. And that's the point of that. In vain and high and holy lays, my song or grateful uh, voice would raise, for who can sing the worthy praise of the wonderful love of Jesus? Are we really worthy to praise him? But yet we do that. And so that's what that word is talking about, is the idea of lays is that of an archaic, it's an archaic word for a song. And this is saying that we sing. This is a song about singing. Singing praises to God as we consider, as we consider how wonderful, that is how full of wonder, the love of Jesus actually is. Another song we might give consideration to is, uh, again, a few passages over. This is another Lord's Supper song, 162, Night with Eben Pinion. And of course, this is actually the first verse the first phrase of this song, and it's the actual title of the song, and it begins by saying, Night with Eben Pinion. Well, what is an Eben Pinion, if you will? Now, as you look at the song and as you go through the song, you find that this is about the time where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's pleading with the Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, yours be done. And, of course, we know the anxiety that he had and various things that happened in that particular garden as he prepared to endure the cross. But he was suffering there. And, of course, the idea of that expression, Eben Pinion, poetically, it's putting that time. And, and the word's not used in the Gospels you know, to describe that occasion. But the idea of Eben is the, is the word black. And so you would be talking about black and not just black, but pitch black. The pinion is, is a bird's wing. You know, so think of a crow. You know, think of a black crow and how dark and black his wings actually are. And the point that is being made here is that this was an occasion that was dark. And it was enshrouding the whole, the darkness was enshrouding the whole area. Perhaps the way that, that a bird would protect their young and enshroud their young. Jesus actually used that as an illustration of what he would have liked to have done for Jerusalem as they rejected him. And uh, at the conclusion of Matthew chapter uh, 24, as you read there. So what the expression here is talking about is how this was a dark, a dark night of betrayal. That's what that expression means. And again, this is the example of this is poet, poetry. And that's the point. It was a dark night. It was a night where Jesus would be betrayed by one of his 12. It was a night where he would be denied and abandoned by all of his disciples. It was a night of great anxiety where he was concerned. It was a night of corruption as Judas betrayed him and as the religious leaders would seek charges against him and fabricate charges so that they could have him executed by crucifixion. And all of that leads to the crucifixion. But yet this song tries to help us understand how dark it was in that garden as Jesus made preparation for what was about to take place. And it does us good to remember that and think about that as we partake of the Lord's Supper. Another song that's dealing with the Lord's Supper, song number 183, Tis Midnight on Olive's Brow. And again, this is at the beginning of the song. It's what you read here uh, in the very first word. And of course, it leads to the question, uh, what is Olive's Brow? And this is one where 
the Bible gives us a little bit of an understanding as well as word definitions. Now, this is another song that's about Jesus as he is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's where you get the idea of the olives from. That is actually a reference to the Mount of Olives, where there was a garden that was on the western slope called the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, but it was on the Mount of Olives. And, of course, Luke 22 and verse 39 tells you that they went to the Mount of Olives, and that's where he will be betrayed. Now, the idea of the word brow that is used here is, is also that of a, a ridge, a ridge that is project, pro projecting out of the side of a hill or a mountain. So again, you have here a poetic description of Jesus as he is in the garden. And, it, and basically what this is designed to remind us of is the fact that this was a real place. And this was a real event that took place, and that's the way that it is described here. A, a sad time, and, and, and Jesus is there praying alone in this garden. And he's preparing to die because we are guilty, because we are sinners. And, and we need his blood to be shed for the remission of our sins. So that's the point of the olive's brow as it is mentioned there. Another phrase we might give consideration to, going to Psalm number 218. Just over in the glory land. And this is a, uh, this is a, a, a joyful song. This is a, a song of hope, knowing that we have a home prepared where the saints abide. It's just over in the glory land. And you might even see the expression of the glory land. Uh, that's a reference to heaven itself, where the glory of God is found. If you were to look at uh, Revelation chapter uh, chapters 4 and 5 that describe the glory surrounding the throne, or if, or if you look at the description in Revelation chapters 21 and 22 of, of the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven and the, just the way that it's described. And I believe that's descriptive of, of what heaven is like, among other things. So that's the idea of the glory land. But now in verse number three, with, a blood, with the blood rush throng, that is those who have been baptized, had their sins washed away, I will shout and sing just over in the glory land. Glad hosannas to Christ the Lord and King just over in the glory land. Talking about glad hosannas. What is a hosanna? Well, it's interesting. The word hosanna actually in the Greek is a word that means help I pray or, or, or save I pray. And it's, it's just found a handful of times in the Gospels and it's associated with the triumphal entry of Jesus into the city. And of course, you may recall that on that day when Jesus was entering the city of Jerusalem, that they were ready to make him a king at that time. And of course, as he enters in on the donkey, the people begin, uh, 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 the people begin lining the road and so on. They laid their clothes on them, and, and, they, uh, and, and it says there's this great multitude that spread their clothes on the road in verse 8 of Matthew 21, cut down branches of, from the trees, spread them on the road, and the multitude went out, before and followed, crying out, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And then he goes into the city. The idea, the idea is, is there's this rejoicing. Our Savior is here. And that's the idea of, of, of uh, Hosanna or save I pray or, or help I pray. We're looking for deliverance. And our deliverers here, of course, they didn't understand what he was delivering them from. Just a few days later, they would turn against him and shout, let him be crucified. But at this time, they're praising him, and you have that word hosannas as it is used there. Well, in our song, the point is, is glad hosannas to Christ the Lord and King. Uh, we're singing those praises to him. We have that type of a hope. And the idea is we have been forgiven. We have been forgiven. And, and so we ought to be singing these uh, praises to him, if you will. Save, I pray, knowing that he is my Savior and acknowledging him as my Savior. And that would be associated with that particular expression. 
The next song I want to give consideration to is Psalm 231, which is Soldiers of Christ Arise. And we actually, in our lesson uh, this morning, actually talked about amongst the things that we need to do to make our call and election sure is we need to put on the armor of God. Well, here we find a song that is about being the soldiers of Christ and what it means to be a part of that army and where to put our armor on and to stand strong as we serve him. This is a song that reminds us we're soldiers in his army and we need to live as soldiers in his army. You know, over in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 4, it talks about no, no one who is enlisted engages himself in the affairs of his life so that he can please him who enlisted him as a soldier. That's a good soldier. We belong to the Lord's army first, and that becomes our priority. Now, in this song, in the, in the last verse of it, um, um, or, um, or in verse number three, rather, it talks about how you stand then in his great might with all his strength endured, but take to arm you for the fight, the panoply of God. What does that word panoply actually mean that is used here? Well, simply stated, the word panoply actually means whole armor. And, and this, is actually, this is actually a transliteration of the actual Greek word for whole armor that is used in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 11 and 13. That's where Paul is telling them to, you know, stand in the power of the Lord. And he says, put on the whole armor of God. And he says it twice. In verse 12, he talks about how uh, the nature of our battle is spiritual, but he says, therefore, put on the whole armor of God. Put on the panoply of God is the point of that particular text. And, and interestingly, you know, just looking at it from a standpoint of the word, the, the suffix or the prefix pan, as it is used, is a word that means all. And the emphasis, of course, here is that we need to put on not just a part of the armor of God, but we need to put on the whole armor of God. We need to give consideration to that. Another song we might give consideration to, number 338. 338, this particular song here, The Great Physician. And of course, this is a song that reminds us that Jesus is our spiritual physician. And you may recall that Jesus over in Matthew chapter 9, you know, he reminded them of who it is that needs the physician, you know, in verse number 12, where he makes the point there. Those who are well have no need of the physician, but those who are sick. And so, you know, I, I've come to heal. Now, in this song, you read in the chorus Sweetest note in seraph song. What is a seraph? Well, and what is a seraph song? Well, the idea of a seraph is actually reference to a class of angels. And the word seraph, and it's actually seraphim, is only found uh, in two verses in the Bible, and that's in Isaiah 6, verses 2 and 6. And, and this is a passage that that records the Lord calling Isaiah to be his prophet, to go to the people of Israel and Judah and to warn them, as well as to other nations and so on. And he sees this vision of seraphim. And it's, it's angels. It's, it's a class of angels somehow. Now, seraph, interestingly, and according to what most of the sources say, seraph is the singular for seraphim. So you're talking about, you know, sweetest note in the song of an angel, or as you could say, angel songs. And that's what you're dealing with in this. And the whole point of this song is it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's talking about how uh, uh, the name of Jesus is sweet. And we ought to see it that way as we are praising Jesus as our great physician. Another song that we might give consideration to is 396. We'll work till Jesus comes. And what we find here in this song, of course, this is a song about 
our responsibility to be busy as long as we are on this earth. And verse 3 talks about here to Jesus Christ, I fled for rest. He bade me uh, cease to roam and lean for succor on his breast till he conduct me home. What does that word succor mean? And again, that's another archaic word. And it's a word that simply means assistance or, or relief in times of distress. And the point is, is when we are dealing with times of distress and we need relief, we can lean on him. Uh, Matthew 11, verse 28, where Jesus gave what we sometimes call the great invitation to them. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He invites us to come to him for the rest that we need. He's there for us is the point of this, the word sucker, leaning for sucker on his breast. And the idea of that is leaning, leaning for comfort and relief close to him. And of course we do that. We trust him until he conduct me home. And that word conduct as it is used there is a word that simply means the idea until he leads us to our home. Another word we might, or another song we might give consideration to is He Leadeth Me in number 407. And what we find in this particular song here, you know, this is talking about how we need to let Him lead us throughout this life. And of course, He leads us primarily through His Word. He gives us direction of what to do. But you read in verse 2 here, Sometimes mid scenes of deepest gloom, sometimes where Eden's bowers bloom, by water still or trouble sea, still tis God's hand that leads me. Now, what is Eden's bower as it is used here? You know, he first of all talks about mid scenes of deepest gloom. We understand that. The word bowers, as I understand, is an archaic word that has reference to a, a beautiful garden. A shady place of rest that, that has trees. A place where you would go to enjoy the, the beauty outdoors. Today we would use the term a, 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 an arbor. Or an arboretum or something to that effect. That's what you're talking about when you've got that word bowers. And of course, it talks about Eden's bower. Now, now what this obviously would be referenced to is the Garden of Eden... Before the fall of man. Remember when Adam and Eve were placed into the garden, this beautiful garden, they were able to do, uh, partake of whatever tree they wanted except for the one, and they enjoyed this garden. I think this expression, Eden's bowers, is talking about a beautiful garden and how beautiful it must have been before the thorns and before the fall of man. Now, this is a contrast in this song, and that's why it's important to understand what he is saying here. Sometimes mid scenes of deepest gloom, that's a sad time. Sometimes where Eden's bowers bloom, that's a beautiful or a wonderful time. So in sadness and in joy, and he goes on, and that's emphasized by waters still or troubled seas. When waters are calm or when they're troubled, he goes on, still tis my God, still tis God's hand that leads me. God's going to continue to lead me no matter what. And that is the point. So this song is telling us that whether we are dealing with sorrow or joy, we trust him to lead us. Another expression we might give consideration to in number 420. O oh, thou fount of every blessing. You see how we can keep going with song after song here. And this is an interesting one that whenever a lesson like this is done, this song is always brought up. Because he says in verse number two here, O thou, uh, here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come. Of course, we look at this song, this is basically a song where we find that God is the source of every blessing that we have, and we need to tune ourselves to appreciate those blessings. But he makes this point, I raise my Ebenezer. What is, what is my Ebenezer? 
Well, first understand that the word Ebenezer is a word that actually in the Hebrew language means a stone of help. It's found one time in the Old Testament in the Bible, and that's over in 1 Samuel 7 and in verse 12. And if you study 1 Samuel, and this is actually the first six or seven chapters leading up to this, you'll find in the first two to three chapters, Samuel is born, but you also find Eli, who is high priest, uh, his sons are wicked, and of course Samuel will replace uh, him when he dies. And so he becomes the priest, he is a prophet, and he's the one who will bring in the kings and so on. Well, it was a sad time for Israel in many ways, and they were dealing with the Philistines who were oppressing them. And you actually read in chapters 4, 5, and 6 of 1 Samuel that, that, that the Philistines are being uh, de delivered, or, or the Israelites are being delivered from the Philistines. And you read about those things, but yet you also find a little bit of gloom uh, because of all the things that have happened and the children of Israel go to Samuel and they ask him to pray for their deliverance from the Philistines. And God answers the prayer and they're delivered from the Philistines. Well, in 1 Samuel 7 and in verse 12, we read here that Samuel sets up a memorial stone and the places listed are Mizpah and Shed. He sets up a memorial stone between Mizpah and Shen, and he called that Ebenezer, a stone of help. And basically that stone served as a reminder to the people that God had helped them, that God had delivered them. And that's what we need to think about. when the. And again, remember, songs are poetry. That's the point. So he finds this word, a stone of help, and he puts that in the song. Here I raise my Ebenezer instead of I raise my stone of help. And the point that is being made here is I know that you've helped me. I remember that. Just as that stone served as a reminder of God being their helper, I set down a reminder that God is there and that God has helped me. That's the idea of the Ebenezer as it is used in this particular song, and that's what he's talking about. And because of that, I can, I can hope to safely arrive as, at home as he continues in that particular verse. That brings me to another song, Jesus, Rose of Sharon, number 445. Another interesting one to give consideration to. What is the, the Rose of Sharon? Well, Sharon is actually the name of a plain in Israel that was described as a very fertile area uh, on the Mediterranean coast. And again, area that belonged to Israel um, in, times, in times past. And, and we find that obviously roses grow. As a matter of fact, you can look it up online. You can find that there is a rose that grows in that region that is named for that region. And it is called the Rose of Sharon. And that's what this song is kind of dealing with. The Rose of Sharon. But we actually find that expression one time in the Bible. Along with the expression lily of the valley and both of these are mentioned in the song of solomon chapter 2 and verse 1 song of solomon is a love poem it's a love poem about a shunammite woman and her beloved and it's about their relationship and the love that they have for one another and 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 and, and how they describe each other in various and different ways and she calls herself, the Shunammite woman calls herself, I am the Rose of Sharon, I am the Lily of the Valley. And of course, we know that both of those expressions are used in songs. Number 594, and I don't have that on my list here, but number 594, he's the Lily of the Valley. It's talking about Jesus. I have found a friend in Jesus. Well, here we have Jesus, Rose of Sharon, bloom within my heart, beauties of thy truth and holiness impart. So it's describing Jesus as one whom we appreciate 
as we would a rose, as we would the lily of, uh, uh, of the valley. And I don't know about you, but I, I, I appreciate the beauty of nature. And I think that's the description. And we ought to look at Jesus with that type of appreciation. The desire is that he ought to bloom within my heart. When I think about Jesus, when I think about who he is, when I, when I think about the beauty of what he has done, the beauty of what he continues to do, may that bloom within my heart. And that's the point of that particular song. Now that brings us to the final song that we want to deal with in this particular section here. And that is, Give Me the Bible number 500 in our songbook. And this is a song obviously about the Word of God and our need for the Word of God. And in the last verse, verse 4, give me the Bible, lamp of life immortal, hold up that splendor by the open grave, show me the light from heaven's shining portal, show me the glory gilding Jordan's wave. What does the word gilding mean? Well, when you look that up, gilding is actually the process of applying a thin layer of gold on an object to enhance its beauty or its appearance, to make it more beautiful. That's what gilding actually is. And of course, gilding Jordan's wave, uh, that's talking about the Jordan River and the waves of the Jordan River. And if you think about the Jordan, you know, the Jordan was actually a very significant river throughout Scripture. Bear in mind that when the children of Israel completed their 40 years in the wilderness, it was the Jordan River that they crossed over to enter the promised land. And you know, you might think about Jordan's wave as it is used here. Remember how when the children of Israel, and this is recorded in Joshua chapters 2 and 3, when they cross over the Jordan, when the high priest with the Ark of the Covenant stepped into the water, the waters stood still a long ways away. The waters rose up. Is that the wave? Gilding Jordan's wave. And of course, the point of that particular expression is to, to, to make the point of our hope of entering the promised land. Show me the glory gilding Jordan's way. Show me the, the glory of what Israel experienced as they were about to enter the promised land and what God did once again to establish his greatness. And that's what I see in that particular expression there. And you know, it's interesting that Jordan is actually found uh, in a lot of songs or a handful of songs in our, our songbooks. And typically, Jordan has become symbolic, associating our finishing up this life and crossing the portal of death to enter into the land that we have been promised, to enter into the eternity of heaven when this life is over. And, and, and there's, a, there's, there's some, it, the wording is not used directly that way in Scripture, but there's so there's some implication where you can set it up and see Jordan, how it would um, symbolically apply to the crossing of Jordan into the promised land and thus symb symbolically apply our finishing our journey in this wilderness, crossing the, the river of death into our promised land. And here in this song, we want, as we look at the Bible, we want to have a greater appreciation of what it means to leave this life and enter into heaven when this life is over. So there you have a handful of descriptions that are associated with, uh, with the Bible. There is another area that we need to give consideration to, and I don't know that I can uh, give this adequate understanding. So uh, I think what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and stop this lesson here and in the future I'm going to present another lesson where we're going to look at some of the more challenging songs that we look at. Uh, uh, for example, uh, when we talk about the broken body of Jesus. And so that's what I want to do in a, in a future lesson 
is I want us to look at those things. And, uh, but for now, I want to commend this lesson to you with the encouragement that in everything we do, we are striving to sing with the spirit and the understanding. So uh, with that in mind at this time, if you would please bow with me. Our dear God and our Heavenly Father, we always thank you for what we have. We thank you for the abundance of blessings that you have given us. And we pray that you will continue to bless us as you see, uh, as you see fit. We are thankful for the avenue of worship that you have provided for us to assemble together from time to time and to worship you and, and to praise you in song, whether it be together or with our families or alone. And dear God, as we sing songs, let us be encouraged. Let us sing with understanding so that we might have greater hope of a home in heaven when this life is over. Go with us through this day. Go with us through our lives and in all that we do, help us to put our trust in you. We ask this through your son's name and amen. And again, I thank you for listening to this lesson and it is my hope that you find benefit in the things that have been said here. And that as you sing your songs, you, uh, you have maybe a little better understanding. And just let me simply say, if you don't understand the meaning of something, look it up. Uh, you can look it up either, first of all, look it up. If it's an obscure word, look it up in the dictionary. Many of the, uh, many of the online dictionaries have the archaic words in there, so you can find it that way. Or, or you can actually do searches for lessons dealing with specific songs, and in many instances, they will explain in greater detail what those meanings are. So give consideration to that and, and let hymns give you the strength that you need as you go through the day and the week to bring glory to God in all that you do. Think about that and thank you for listening. And, and until next week, have, have a good week and farewell for now.